Okay. Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening, hola, hello, bonjour, hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, hello all, welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 68th seminar, and I call it on Austria Day. Recently, I have read and thought about AI and chat GPT a lot. The innovative tools will be useful in generating articles, pictures, and even music. However, I am also concerned about their use. More importantly, writing papers, drawing pictures, and composing music are the main way to express our ideas, emotions, and views on life and science. I am more touched by human-made music because I feel the emotion, creativity, and greatness of the human composer. I hope masterpieces are still created by humans, not AI. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Dithard Metanovich. He is a professor at University of Natural Resources and Life Science, in other words, Boku, Vienna, Austria. I met him in person last year when I visited Boku to give a talk. As you know, Austria is the nation of music with many great composers. And thanks to his hospitality during my visit, I enjoyed music, science, and a combination of art and science in Austria. I believe he is not only a scientific researcher, but also an artist. Professor Metabo Metanovich, I really thank you for your time and for huge contribution to the scientific community and also public and the virtual podium is all yours. And thank you again for your time today. Thank you, Tesok. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here and uh, uh, yeah, giving me the stage for a very brief uh, uh, introduction. So uh, it's, it's not my place, first of all, here. Uh, and I. I decided not to give a scientific talk, uh, rather, uh, yeah, trying to, to, to give a, a few learnings from my career and how it started, uh, what I learned from it, uh, uh, yeah, and some, like the major points that, that still keep me uh, liking what I do and, 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 you know, keeping the passion of, of uh, research in our field. And, so, <clears throat> yeah, just actually, I, I started off, uh, it's a bit more than a few years ago, uh, uh, actually with, with a, a bunch of, of ideas and research areas where we have been active more like uh, on, on applied questions uh, in, in the field of uh, recombinant protein production. We have been working on different hosts of bacteria and yeast and uh did tool development uh worked with some specific production strains as questions came in and some uh like uh, industrial interest to to help out troubleshooting and that stuff it was definitely interesting and and uh a learning i i would not like to miss uh it also gave me a very good introduction on like how industry is thinking and working and and uh that was a great basis also to uh, a lot of of future industrial collaborations uh that that shaped my research also uh very positively i would say but on the other hand uh yeah I, at some point i figured out that uh, uh yeah my research was somehow uh, lacking a, a focus uh i figured we we were getting a bit shallow in the sense of, you know, not digging deep, rather scratching surfaces here and there. 
So I decided to focus uh, still in the field of protein production, focus on one, one host organism and trying really to understand everything about it. Let's say everything is always a big claim, but that's the thing you should have a big claim for your own uh, research. Uh, so that organism was the yeast. Uh, at that time, it was called Pichia pastoris, still familiar under that name. Uh, today, it's called uh, Comagatella puffy, uh, a metallotrophic yeast, uh, well known for protein production, but it can do a lot more also. So, uh, this decision, I think it was the best in my career, uh, simply speaking, but it did not improve the funding situation immediately. So I, I was lacking money at that time, really. And uh, uh, But I must say, it, I would not like to miss that experience. Uh, this financial low really helped uh, further to, to shape the approach and the own aspiration. Uh, and also thinking back, I. I would say it keeps me grateful uh, to what we have achieved afterwards. Uh, so, if, in other words, if if you are uh, if if you're starting with uh, a funding low, or if if you ever have a like a, such a, a depth in your career, uh, never give up and and uh, uh, understand that yeah, it it's helpful also to kind of yeah yeah shape your your approach also to to the, the work you do and the funding now i said uh uh what we achieve i think the the word we is it's one of the key points definitely in my career and it should be in every career of uh of uh, all of us of all researchers i would say so research in biotechnology and syn synthetic biology is a team effort. I cannot imagine a uh, <clears throat> a significant uh, research, let's say, output or project in our area that is is not driven by the minds of several people and the efforts of several people uh, as a team. And actually, I see these teams as as the most valuable resource. Uh, we often talk about funding and about the money, and of course, this is. The resource, but it's mainly the resource to to shape the teams and to keep them together. So, uh, building and managing uh, a group, I would say, is the most important aspect of of being a PI. Uh, so, uh, yeah, to to build on that and and uh, also, yeah, grow uh, in that role. I think is is one of the most important things and. Uh, Growing from small to larger, uh, it's an experience I made, uh, is not so easy. Uh, there is something like uh, a magical number of uh, teams that get larger than, than, say, 20 people definitely are too large to be managed by a single person. So uh, then that's the latest point where structures need to be made in a group and you need a, a senior members of your group that manage uh, sub teams. Uh, otherwise, yeah, trouble is on the horizon in, in some way, because essentially uh, you as or I actually I went through this as a PI. Uh, at some point, you cannot manage everything well. And uh, uh, so you are letting people down at one point. Um, collaboration is, is another important area. I, I will not extend on that a lot. I think that's very obvious. Uh, so yeah, collaborate with other groups. It's not necessary to do everything and to know everything, uh, uh, just teaming up internationally uh, is, is yeah another of the greatest experiences I've made over the years. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, focus and and going deep uh asking the difficult questions not just the low hanging fruits uh being patient uh some of the things i wanted to realize it took me years to be able to do that either uh, for funding reasons or to get the methods at hand uh, uh to solve that uh so don't give up uh if 
you want to achieve something, it may even be worth getting back to that 10 years later. Um, yeah, just uh, a few words uh, uh, about the research we are doing. So yeah, we are working on, on uh, Comagatella puffy on this methylotrophic yeast. Uh, uh, over years, we did a lot on, on improving protein production. We were digging into the, the protein synthesis and secretion uh, pathway. Uh, keep in mind, and that's what you see in my background here, uh, yeast is not yeast. So the, the genomic divergence of yeast is huge. And, and the illustration uh, tries to explain that this is like Convagatella versus Saccharomyces cerevisiae is like if you compare a human to a nematode. Uh, and you would understand that you can exp cannot explain everything about a human when you look at the nematode genome. Uh, so yeah, uh, from that we were building resources, uh, databases, uh, genome engineering tools, analytical tools, uh, uh, really having a lot uh, at our hands at the moment. And from that, uh, yeah, we thought a lot more about, yeah, uh, the sustainability aspect in biotechnology. And, and one concern certainly is, uh, let's say, by replacing oil as a resource by, uh, let's say, glucose or starch as the major resource in, in industrial biotech, uh, you avoid a problem, but uh, it, it's it's creating a, a, a further issue that is, uh, yeah, the dependency on agricultural resources. So, uh, uh, K-Puffy offers a, a great uh, chance there because it uses C1 uh, uh, feedstocks like methanol, uh, and we turn that also into, uh, let's say, uh, uh, changing the metabolism into a, a CO2 assimilating uh, pathway. Uh, and that's where we are now very much in, in the C1 biotechnology, methanol, we think about formate also, CO2 as pathway, as substrates to make uh, chemicals and getting back to proteins also like animal-free uh, protein, food protein, another huge, I mean, quantitatively huge uh, area of the future. So uh, we would need a lot of feedstocks there to be able to produce that. Okay, yeah, my time is really up as I see. And uh, uh, yeah, just a few last words, so to say, like what you do and like to interact with people. I think this is the, the main learnings I had. Don't let rejection get you down. I think academic research is so much about rejection. Your okay. paper is getting rejected. Uh, your grant application is rejected, uh, whatsoever. Your, your Tina, uh, is rejected even worse uh yeah in the end it's about brilliant ideas and and uh, uh don't let the rejections get close to you uh don't ignore them they tell you something but uh yeah and my last word if your postdoc uh is being smarter with a solution than you are that's the best moment you can have Okay, so thank you. yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you so much. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, you know, the most important thing is never give up. And you know, the rejection you we used to and we just accept the rejection and then improve further because otherwise, I mean, it is impossible to move on. And I'll give some you know example, you know, even Bob Langer at MIT when he was young. You know his his you know topic is not accepted by the you know senior professors, but she never gave up, and then he become now the most famous engineer in in you know in the world right now with the many many company you know he founded and so on, and you know and also you also mentioned collaboration importance. I mean always always big thing, only possible to achieve with the other people, other experts. So that's absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much for your wisdom. And I believe young people will uh, appreciate you know, what you, thank you said. Thank you. Okay. So now, 
the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. Dr. Yang Yang obtained his bachelor degree in chemistry from Beijing University in uh, 2011. He received his PhD degree in organic chemistry in 2016 at MIT. And at MIT, he developed CUH uh, catalyzed uh, copper hydrogen catalyzed in a method for the asymmetric hydro functionalization of simple olefins. As a NIH postdoctoral fellow working with Francis, Professor Francis Arnor at Caltech, he studied biocatalysts and protein engineering and developed biocatalytic asymmetric CH amination. Dr. Yang started his independent career at uh, UC Santa Barbara 2020 by integrating synthetic chemistry, biocatalysis, protein engineering, bioinformatics, and computational tools his group is reprogramming nature's biosynthetic machineries to address challenging problems in synthetic chemistry and asymmetric catalysis. Dr. Yang is a recipient of the V-Agents Junior Faculty Fellowship Award, Faculty Career Development Award, NSF Career Award, NIH Maximizing Investigators Research Award, one of the most competitive award, and also uh, Theme Chemistry Journals Award this year. Professor Francis Arnold, in fact, is my academic grandma, so he is my academic uncle. As you can see, he is a truly rising star with many pre prestigious awards, although he started his faculty position only a few years ago. Now, Uncle Yang, and thanks so much for your time today, and please take it away. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Taisu. Thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> it's uh, I'm, I'm humbled to be your academic uncle. I, I think you can be my faculty mentor, so <laughs> it, it's a little um, embarrassing <laughs> from my side. Um, but uh, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to be at this uh, seminar series and share with you and, and other people about one of the ongoing projects in my lab. So let me uh, start sharing slides. Okay. Does that look, look okay to you? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I think I'm going to get started. Great. So it's... Uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk about uh, one of the ongoing projects in my lab, uh, which relates to the use of metalloproteins to trigger new to nature stereoselective radical reactions. So I figure I'll give a general introduction to the field of biocatalysis and protein engineering first. Um, so as many of you know, enzymes are the products of billions of years of evolution. So they really allow for some of the most challenging reactions like N2 fixation and methane oxidation under very mild conditions. Um, today, biocatalysis has gone way beyond academic curiosity. Uh, with protein engineering, uh, people have evolved lots of enzymes to accommodate non-natural substrates. So here I'm showing you a few examples, including transaminases, uh, lipases, and ketoreductases. And only with these engineered enzymes, researchers in the pharmaceutical industry have been able to develop biomanufacturing routes to prepare these pharmaceutical compounds. And these include cycliptin, pregabalin, and atorvastatin. So the ability to quickly modify or engineer those protein catalysts is really essential to the implementation of biocatalytic and biotransformation technologies. Um, in my group, we really work at the interface of synthetic chemistry and biocatalysis. And by bridging these two areas, we are developing new biocatalytic tools to solve problems in synthesis and catalysis. 
In terms of basic research, we are very passionate about this field known as asymmetric catalysis. So asymmetric catalysis essentially deals uh, with the generation of compounds with handedness or chirality. So as many of you know, uh, your left hand and your right hand look very similar, but they don't superimpose. So to selectively generate compounds with the right handedness, uh, a very powerful tool is known as asymmetric catalysis. We think enzymes are really powerful uh, for enantial selective transformations. And this is mainly because of the many interactions between the substrate and the protein scaffold within the active site. And more importantly, using protein engineering technologies, we can quickly modify those types of interactions and very rapidly evolve highly stereoselective protein catalysts. On the other hand, biocatalysis inherently satisfy many of the requirements for sustainable synthesis and green chemistry. Um, most of the biocatalytic reactions occur in water, which is the ideal solvents uh, for synthetic transformations. And furthermore, biocatalysts are eventually produced by your favorite microbial hosts, whether it's E. coli or yeast. So the production of biocatal biocatalysis is, is only requires uh, very renewable uh, feedstocks like carbohydrates or e uh, yeast extracts. And all of these features are desirable from a green chemistry uh, or sustain sustainability standpoint. For our fundamental research, we are primarily interested in, uh, in the control of stereoselectivity for free radical mediated transformations. So here I'm showing you the general structure of a carbon center radical and a nitrogen center radical. So those radical species are very reactive intermediates with an unpaired electron. In synthetic chemistry, due to the inherently high reactivity of these species, they really allow for some of the most interesting transformations. So due to the interesting properties of these free radical species, they have caught attention of people from various areas. But in synthetic chemistry, free radical reactions are useful uh, in many, in, in mainly two fields. First of all, you can use free radical chemistry to make and build complex natural products. So here I'm showing you one such example developed by Holden uh, in the synthesis of this compound called Taxusin. So using radical chemistry, they were able to make the highlighted carbon-carbon bond with excellent efficiency. Radical chemistry is also useful in polymer synthesis. And most strikingly, uh, the vast majority of the common commodity chem uh, polymers we, we, we see in our everyday life are actually prepared by radical polymerizations. Although this radical polymerization is not done in a serial controlled manner, it speaks to the power of radical chemistry in the production of soft, soft materials. So given the utility of radical chemistry in both small molecule synthesis and also natural molecule synthesis, if we can make an impact in this field, uh, we'll be able to change uh, many sub-disciplines of synthetic chemistry. Now, although radical chemistry is, is powerful, it's also widely known that stereo control in radical chemistry is a, is a very challenging problem. So there are two fundamental reasons underlying this difficult difficulty. First of all, uh, due to the inherently high react, uh, reactive nature of, of these free radical species, um, controlling the selectivity involving these intermediates is, is a challenge. In synthetic chemistry, there's this empirical rule known as reactivity selectivity trade-off. And based on this empirical observation, if you are generating a highly reactive intermediate, uh, it's oftentimes hard for you to control the selectivity associated with transformations of that intermediates. Perhaps more importantly, once you generate free radical species with a small molecule catalyst, that free radical species can rapidly diffuse away and there's gonna be no interactions between your small molecule catalyst and the free radical species. 
I think this really underscored the challenge in, in imposing stereo control in these radical transformations because there's no very well established enantial induction mode for you to impose excellent stereo control over bond forming uh, processes involving either carbon center radicals or nitrogen center radicals. So we thought this is a great problem for us to focus on uh, because if we can generate radical species within the enzymes active site, then we might be able to control the stereochemistry of the downstream transformations. So prior to our work, uh, important contributions from the Heister lab and, and uh, Professor Hui Ming Zhao's lab uh, has, has uh, inspired our work. But I think our approach to this problem is unique and distinct from all the prior contributions. So we have multiple areas or uh, ideas in this field, but today I'm only going to talk with you uh, about one specific area, which is to use metalloproteins to trigger free radical reactions using a redox mechanism. Quite surprisingly, uh, a lot of the naturally occurring proteins are actually metalloproteins. And among all these natural metalloproteins, roughly 10 to 20 percent had a first row transition metal cofactor. And many of these first row transition metal cofactors are redox active. So here I'm only showing you examples from iron dependent enzyme. So in general, there are heme and non-heme dependent uh, iron proteins uh, in nature. So those iron dependent enzymes uh, have a redox active iron center. In addition to iron dependent enzyme, there is also cobalt, copper, and manganese and nickel dependent proteins. And, Due to the huge diversity of these natural metalloproteins, we think they could be an excellent um, resource for the discovery of biocatalysts. The activation mechanism we envision with metalloproteins is very simple, but potentially generalizable. So in our research, we take advantage of the redu reducing power of those first row transition metal cofactors in radical generation. So as shown in this activation paradigm, starting from a low oxidation state metal cofactor, single electron transfer from the metal center to the uh, organic radical precursor is going to generate an organic radical. Meanwhile, it also leads to this oxidized form of the metal cofactor. So in the case of iron, uh, starting from iron two, we can generate an organic radical and also form an iron three uh, species. Importantly, once we have access to this carbon center radical, we're gonna be able to use protein engineering to control the downstream stereochemistry. We think this is generalizable and we are in the process of extending this activity to nitrogen radical chemistry. No, so, so now at this point, I'd like to take a step back and, and share with you our research philosophy to discover enzyme activity not known in nature. So, so you might wonder how do we create such enzyme activity uh, which are not known in the biological world? And the answer to this question is related to a very important concept in biochemistry known as promiscuity. So enzyme promiscuity refers to the ability of the enzyme to catalyze reactions other than the ones they are physiologically evolved for. Although enzymes are widely perceived as very specific catalysts, perhaps people didn't realize that enzymes are also inherently promiscuous or they have the extra talent to catalyze unnatural reactions. Interestingly, in the history of evolution, enzyme promiscuity has played a very important role in the emergence of interesting enzyme functions. Presumably in the very early days of life, there's a very small collection of biochemistry available to the very primitive forms of life. But then if certain biochemical function or a certain enzyme is useful to catalyze other reactions, and if this other function can be beneficial to the survival of the microorganism, then through, uh, through evolution, nature, nature quickly figure out ways to improve the activity of these promiscuous enzyme functions. So in our lab, we try to learn from the natural emergence of 
of biochemical diversity. And we take advantage of enzyme promiscuity to discover new to nature enzyme functions. In this research, we first build a collection of enzyme um, that uh, may catalyze the reaction of interest. So in this process, our research is always guided by our understanding from synthetic chemistry. So we took inspirations and we use our knowledge from synthetic chemistry to guide the selection of this enzyme library and the selection of reaction of interest. And then we perform initial screening using the in-house built enzyme library. Once we discover some initial activity, it can be a very low activity. We're gonna use directed evolution to quickly improve the enzyme activity and selectivity of the process. Eventually with our evolved enzymes, we hope to solve problems in synthesis and catalysis. So as many of you are familiar with, Directed evolution is a powerful engineering process uh, to optimize protein function by repeated rounds of mutation and selection or screening. For directed enzyme evolution, we usually start from a parent gene which encodes the parent protein. Through mutagenesis methods, either by focused mutagenesis or random mutagenesis, we're gonna generate a library of genes. And then protein expression using 96 well plates is gonna provide a protein library, which is ready uh, for reaction evaluation. At this moment, uh, we usually perform the screening also in 96 well plates. And hopefully after the screening, we're gonna identify improved enzyme variants with better activity or stereoselectivity. So at this stage, we sequence the enzyme variant to learn what beneficial mutations have been introduced into the protein scaffold. In the next round of engineering, uh, we're gonna use this improved protein variant as the parent. And through iterative rounds of engineering, we're gonna be able to quickly optimize the performance of the enzyme catalyst. So combining our chemical intuition and direct evolution, so we are going to be able to discover interesting and synthetically useful enzyme functions, which are not known in the biological world. So in this metalloenzyme program, we are primarily interested in this reaction known as atom transfer radical addition process. In this reaction, we add a carbon halogen bond across the carbon carbon double bond of an, of an olefin. And in doing so, we can quickly generate stereo stereochemical complexity from easily available starting materials. And up to three contiguous stereogenic centers will, uh, will be available in a single operation. So this is, a, uh, this is a nice way to build molecular complexity. So this process is known to synthetic chemistry. However, despite decades of efforts, there's no general methods to control the stereoselectivity of this atom transfer type radical reactions. And this is precisely the problem we're trying to solve using enzyme catalysis and protein engineering. So in our early work, we focus on the intramolecular variant of this atom transfer radical addition reaction, which is also known as atom transfer radical cyclization. So in this slide, I'm showing you the overall mechanism for atom transfer radical cyclization process. Starting from a ferrous protein catalyst, uh, halogen atom transfer is gonna first generate a carbon center radical as shown here. Once we have this highly reactive carbon center radical, uh, addition to the pendant alkene is gonna provide a new carbon center radical. So at this moment, radi uh, radical rebound uh, with, the, with the halide in this ferric halide species will eventually provide the a radical cyclization product. And it also returns the ferric halide catalyst back to the ferrous protein catalyst and complete the catalytic cycle. So the overall mechanism seems simple, but uh, in our recent work, we realized that it's, it's really complex. So there are a few interesting features I'd like to point out this, at this moment. First of all, in synthetic organic chemistry, it's gonna be very difficult for you to control the stereochemistry for this free radical addition step. And this is because due to the lack of catalyst radical interactions, 
you're not going to be able to to tightly influence the bond forming stereochemistry. In principle, you can potentially influence the stereochemistry for the second halogen atom transfer event. But in literature, there is only a handful of results and stereo control of the prior work are always very modest. So if we could develop biocatalysts for a highly stereo controlled atom transfer cyclization reactions, it's gonna be a synthetically useful advance. From an enzyme catalysis perspective, the fact that we have a I, uh, we have a heme dependent halogenase is also interesting. This is because a uh, heme dependent halogenase using a radical rebound mechanism is actually unknown in natural enzymology. In nature, uh, several mechanisms have been evolved to allow for selective halogen halogenation reactions. Uh, there are flavin-dependent halogenases and also non-heme alpha ketoglutarate dependent halogenases previously reported, characterized, and studied. There are also heme-dependent haloperoxidases, but these heme enzymes usually generate a highly reactive and freely diffusing halo hyper hyperhalide intermediate. And radical rebound mechanism at a ferric heme center is, is never reported in heme enzymology. So the new to nature activity, or specifically this halogenase activity associated with heme enzyme is an interesting addition to, to, to enzymology. So in this research, we first evaluate our collection of metalloproteins. So here I'm only showing you our results with iron dependent enzymes, but we've also looked into other metal dependent enzymes so far. Quite surprisingly, uh, lots of interesting enzymes display initial activity, and these include heme-dependent enzymes as well as some non-heme-dependent systems. We focus our early effort with a cytochrome P450 because this enzyme variant really provided non-zero enantial selectivity for this target transformation. Okay, so here I'm showing you the um, optimized set of protein catalysts for this transformation. In short, we've evolved complementary set of enzymes, including P450 ATR case one and P450 ATR case two for this transformation. With P450 ATR case one, this product with the R stereo center can be formed with excellent selectivity and excellent total turnover numbers. Using the complementary enzyme P450 ATR case 2, um, the opposite enantiomer can be formed with also good enantial selectivity and activity. And most interestingly, those two enzyme variants are only about five mutations away from each other. So this really speaks to the power of protein engineering to quickly change the serial selectivity of the enzyme catalyst. So in this work, the protein engineering can be done using routine techniques. Through iterative rounds of size saturation mutagenesis, we're able to identify beneficial mutations and we can quickly improve the enzyme activity uh, from 60 to 40 in enantiomeric ratio to 97 to three. So the starting enzyme is barely uh, enantioselective, but after five rounds of engineering, the final variant is highly stereoselective. And furthermore, we, we carefully characterize the kinetic uh, behavior or, uh, of this enzyme and the total turnover number of our evolved enzyme can be as good as 20,000, which is, which is very good. Uh, in this effort, uh, we also made an interesting discovery on the axial ligand effect for this heme enzyme. So in the evolution of P450 ATR case two, we realized that if we replace the iron binding residue with an alanine, which lacks a coordinating functional group, the enzyme is still fairly active. And in fact, it displays a slightly better activity compared to any of the uh, iron ligated enzyme variant. So to our knowledge, this is a very interesting discovery and it's perhaps the first example of a heme enzyme lacking any iron binding residue with interesting act, uh, activities. In nature, 
Essentially, all of the heme enzymes will have at least one heme binding residue. But in this new to nature chemistry, uh, this uh, alanine variant lacking any heme residue appear to be highly reactive. And we are, uh, we are pursuing this study further to better understand the properties and structure of these alanine mutants. So our evolved enzyme displayed a reasonable substrate scope for this atom transfer reaction and substitutions at the aromatic ring are readily tolerated. Perhaps more importantly, uh, this process is also compatible with alkenes with different substitution patterns. So with, this, with these evolved enzymes, we can access products with contiguous quaternary stereo centers, which is a challenge uh, for, synth for synthetic chemistry. Um, alkenes with 1,1 dialkyl substituents are also compatible. And in this process, uh, alkene product instead of the halide is produced. And we think this reaction involves a radical polar crossover mechanism without actually forming the, the halide intermediate. Alpha-alpha uh, difluorotype precursors are compatible. And finally, we can also use this process to generate four-member ring as well as six-member ring. In future engineering efforts, we think we're going to be able to improve the stereoselectivity of all these cyclization reactions and develop a general toolbox for atom transfer radical cyclization process. Another interesting feature is the ability for us to control not only the enantial selectivity, but also the diastereoselectivity of this process. Through a similar uh, engineering campaign, we're able to identify, again, complementary enzymes to access either this or the other um, diastereomeric products. And as you can see from the slide, they only differ in one stereogenic center resulting from the radical addition step. And the other stereogenic center formed from the halogen atom rebound remain essentially the same. So uh, upon careful literature uh, survey, we realized that with small molecule catalysts like the copper type polymerization catalyst, even diastereo control is very difficult with these types of atom transfer reactions. So these protein catalysts uh, uh, is a potentially interesting alternative to performing not only enantial selective, but also diastereo selective atom transfer catalysis. Due to the excellent activity of our evolved enzyme variant, we could easily carry out gram scale synthesis with a relatively small amount of uh, whole E. coli cells. In this gram scale synthesis, we then were able to derivatize the alkyl bro bromide product into various classes of useful compounds. So we realized that these uh, evolved uh, protein catalysts are actually bifunctional. And in direct evolution, we serendipitously introduced a hydrogen bond donor moiety, uh, in this case, a, a glutamine residue. We think that this glutamine residue is very important uh, to engage the uh, radical intermediate through hydrogen bonding interactions with the amide carbonyl. So this hydrogen bonding interaction is important, not only in terms of act substrate activation, but also for enantial control. So with this additional interruption, we sort of anchor the radical intermediate within the active site. And this further reduces the degree of freedom of this radical species, allowing better enantial control to be accomplished. More interestingly, with both enantial complementary enzymes, we always introduce a glutamine residue in our enzyme engineering effort. With P450 ATR case one, this glutamine residue is found in the alpha helix. So this residue is at 263. With the complementary enzyme, the glutamine residue is present in a flexible loop. So as you can see, there's a glutamine residue at 437. So this really speaks with the power of directed evolution to identify previously unrecognized activation modes and, and quickly improve enzyme catalysis efficiency. So we sort of 
corroborate our understanding here by doing site directed mutagenesis experiments. So with our evolved enzyme ATR case one, uh, we replace this glooming residue with other potential hydrogen bond donor residues and other residues lacking such a motif. So we found that if we replace the glutamine with an arginine or lysine, the enzyme retains a substantial amount of selectivity as well as reactivity. If you remove a methylene unit from glutamine and convert it to asparagine, um, this resulting variant start to have a lower activity and enantioselectivity. Eventually, if you completely remove the hydrogen bond donor or make it inaccessible to the radical intermediate, then uh, the enzyme activity and selectivity will drop significantly. So those results are consistent with our understanding um, on the axial ligand effect. So we also had an interest in developing radical reactions involving nitrogen radical chemistry. So here I'm go going to briefly show you uh, our, our work on uh, in the development of a new to nature fluorinase. In terms of the reaction mechanism, it's similar to the carbon radical chemistry we, we talked about. So this process follows an atom transfer mechanism. Starting from this fluoroamide starting material, uh, radical initiation with a, with a non-heme enzyme or any types of, of metallo enzymes is gonna generate a nitrogen center radical. At this stage, very fast, one five hydrogen atom transfer is going to convert this nitrogen center radical into a new benzylic carbon center radical. At this stage, if radical rebound with the fluoride can happen, then we're going to have access to a carbon fluorine bond forming enzyme. So this is our proposal. We think this is a very interesting process because in nature, there's only a single example of carbon fluorine bond forming enzyme. And for this reason, this enzyme is known as defluorinase because there's only one fluorinase characterized to date. With a natural fluorinase, using an SN2 type mechanism, it converts SAM to the corresponding fluorinated product. And this fluorinated product is essentially the origin of a vast majority of fluorine containing natural products. Researchers in enzymology and synthetic biology have been interested in discovering other mechanisms to introduce the fluoride uh, using enzymatic processes. So if we could have a new to nature metallo enzyme to make carbon fluorine bonds, we think that's gonna make an impact in multiple areas. In terms of non-heme enzymology, we think this is also an interesting addition to the state of the art. Previously, researchers have been studying alpha ketoglutarate dependent halogenases uh, in CH halogenation reactions. In natural activity or unnatural activity, it has been discovered that you can introduce a chloride, an azide, and, nit and a nitro compound uh, group uh, through such a, a CH functionalization mechanism. Despite a years of efforts, converting those enzymes into a fluorinating enzyme has been unsuccessful. So it was unclear what exact problem uh, is there. So I think our research will provide some insights into this uh, not very understood problem. So in short, we've been able to evolve a new to nature fluorinase to allow for uh, this CH fluorination process. So in our work, we've been focusing on enzymes with a his 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 facial triad. So with these non-heme enzymes we, we've been working with, uh, uh, we discover an initial activity for this new to nature fluorination process. And then through an engineering effort, we're able to quickly improve um, the enzyme activity and, and we've been able to discover enzymes with complementary ac activities. So in the future, we like to further expand uh, the, uh, the utility of these fluorinating enzymes and, and to further study their 
uh, structural activity relationships. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude this talk uh, by summarizing our ideas in this field. I hope I've convinced you that the concept of metalloredox radical biocatalysis is an emerging field of research. So I've only showed you our results with iron-dependent enzymes, but there's really a lot of opportunities we can potentially think about um, repurposing metalloenzymes to catalyze those free radical reactions. I think we're only scratching the surface in this field. And there's lots of interesting results to expect in this emerging area of research. So finally, I'd like to conclude this talk by, by thanking um, my students and collaborators. And they're the person, they're the ones who did the work and um, nothing is gonna be possible without their contributions. So uh, thank you, Tai Silk for the introduction and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Amazing talk, thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Guitar, do you have any comment or question? Uh, <clears throat> I have a question if I may, but before that, uh, thank you a lot for for your talk. That's really, uh, yeah, has been very enlightening for me, very interesting, really. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, <clears throat> yeah. I'm a bit attached uh, to to some uh, enzyme engineering work, not not by ourselves but by colleagues, uh, and and that that's super exciting. Uh, my question now is uh, like for the process in in very general terms, uh, uh, starting with a parent protein, as you said, that at least has uh, let's say a a little bit of activity in the direction you want to evolve. Uh, um for to to find such parent proteins uh are you using um uh, uh also let's say uh are you basing that also on, on on computational predictions alone um i'm thinking also of metabolic engineering where we yeah we get into situations where we you know we, we need a reaction and we don't have an annotated enzyme for that um so i'm thinking of of predictions like the enzyme atlas um atimanicatis atlas or or uh, structure predictions maybe like alpha fold etc um yeah that's yeah the, these are all very important things for us to consider detard so to answer this question um i think we've been using a combination of approaches here so we've had success with enzymes people previously studied. So mm -hmm. for example, the P450s are from P450 BM3 lineage. So those are extensively studying biotechnology, but no one has used these for atom transfer catalysis. For the non-heme enzyme we've been working with, that's also a enzyme uh, previously studied and discovered in biosynthesis efforts. So there's a crystal structure known, which is mm -hmm. very useful for our protein engineering efforts. But we've also been using a more bioinformatics or or you know alpha fold type structural tools uh, to to expand our enzyme collection. So we've we've been able to develop a workflow uh, to you know focus on enzymes with desirable structural features, and then we we can just order the G blocks and and further expand our enzyme library for for our effort. So there are a few important things for us to consider in this expansion of our enzyme library. So first of all, in terms of the active site, you know, there has to be an active site, right? So, so there are metalloproteins which are responsible for electron transfer and these metalloproteins do not have a substrate binding pocket. Mm -hmm. In our research, these metalloproteins are not, not very useful. And also we like to have a relatively sc stable protein scaffold because in our field, people generally believe that there is a correlation between evolvability and stability. So if we can have access to stable proteins, it's gonna also be very useful to our research. So we've gathered thoughts and, and ideas like these, and uh, we've, we've been using these to 
to guide our selection of potential metalloprotein targets for our research. So this is still an ongoing effort in the lab. Um, I hope that in the future, we can discover interesting enzyme activities with sequences from, from the database and know that no one else has previously looked into. Thank so, you. Thank you. I guess, I mean, I should let Dr. Yang go. She needs to teach. So let me close. So uh, unfortunately, if you have a question, you know, just send me email or send email to him and then he will, you know, uh, answer that question uh, through email. So it's my pleasure, Kai Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for so, the invitation. I, I look forward to seeing you in person in the future. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hope so. Thanks a lot. Bye. Talk okay. to you later. Bye. Talk to you later. So I'll close. So thank you all uh, for joining and staying today. We'll meet again on February 23rd, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Basili Kachimanikaktis uh, at EPFL, Switzerland, and Professor Nicholas Graham at University of Southern California. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. So please stay here if you are interested in chatting with uh, you know, today, today's speaker and me, and I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty face if you wish. And thanks again, I will stop recording. Just give me one second. Okay.